live streaming. Got it. And uh, let's see. Hello, YouTube. I think you're there. Welcome to our first official seminar of spring 2024 and a record to the cloud. I got it. All right. <clears throat> I think we are good to go. So welcome everyone. We have um, a long delayed and much, <laughs> uh, anticipated. much anticipated seminar today from a very <laughs> special speaker. So today it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce today's speaker. So today we have Dr. Mark Brown. Uh, Mark Brown is a professor emeritus, which basically means uh, very respected professor <laughs> who has retired now. But Mark was a professor in environmental engineering sciences, um, has an interesting history actually. And if I get something bit wrong, you'll, you'll excuse me, but we've been colleagues for quite quite a while since 2012. And I've, I hired him. He hired me. <laughs> and I have to say all these nice things about him. So Mark Brown's great. He's a good woodworker. He's a good cook. He's very good at selecting red wine, especially. Um, but he's been a professor here and along with his uh, mentor, Howard Odom, really launched a new paradigm for how the environment is valued. And a really probably still one of the few holistic ways to count up the value of nature to, to society. Um, and he's going to tell us a little bit about that today. But um, Dr. Brown started as an architecture student, has a degree in architecture before starting to work here at the Center for Wetlands in 1973, right when it was launched. So been hanging out around this building for now 50 and a half years, which is pretty amazing. And really, again, revolutionized not just in Florida, but across the, the, the nation and across the globe, how we try to balance the needs of society with the needs of nature. Um, he's a fellow of the American Ecological Engineering Society as of last year, right? Yeah. Their first, their first um, cohort of fellows. He was the former president of the AES, um, and he was the founder of the Center for Environmental Policy, I think, here at, at UF. Um, and served as director of the Center for Wetlands from 2006 to 2016. Oh, you got it all. I Googled it right before. I'll forget <laughs> again now. So, Mark, with that, the floor is yours. And thank you so much for leading us off this, this well, semester. Thank you very much. Um, so this lecture is about six years in the making. Um, we got a um, NSF USDA project um, roughly six years ago, and that was before the pandemic. And there was a huge amount of travel, as you'll see. Uh, this is all about seafood, and, and we 70% of the seafood that we consume in this country is imported. So in order to get the data for all of that, um, I was going to be the one traveling all over the world collecting it. And then uh, COVID hit, and it stopped all of that. And therefore, the time that uh, it took to get the data uh, got um, really extended as a result of when you're in somebody's space and you say, can I have some data? They usually come up with the data right away. When you ask them on the phone or send them an email, they go, yeah, yeah, I'll get to them. And I'll, you know how that goes. Yeah, and they hide so, uh, <clears throat> USA Seafood, Energy Water, uh, Nexus, um, identifying strategies for increased um, efficiencies and waste reduction. Um, so it's uh, uh, Infuse T3, which was uh, the acronym from NSF, reduced the, and the name of the, co uh, the project was Reducing Resource Use at the Seafood Energy Water Nexus, uh, Focus on Efficient Production and Waste Reduction. The PI was Ronnie Neff um, from John Hopkins, and there's a couple of other uh, faculty there. There was also some faculty from ASU um, and U of F. Uh, Frank Ash, Jim Anderson, and myself, and a postdoc, Silvia, Silvio um, Biblia, and uh, Lee Maijin, and Tyron Gridlock were Peter, our postdocs on the project. So it was a big project. <clears throat> so background of the study, examples of detailed analysis. I'm going to use farmed catfish. A comparison of wild caught and farmed salmon. Uh, the U.S. aquatic uh, uh, food supply chain from net farm to the plate. This is one of the only studies uh, on the planet that has looked at a um, group of food from farm or caught all the way to the plate and how much energy and water it requires to bring it there. 
Um, I did an extensive review of the literature and no one has been able to put all of that together at one time. So we're the first. Um, and then if we have time, an energy evaluation, which is what um, Dr. Kaplan was talking about, of wild caught versus farmed salmon. Um, so we'll see. Uh, the goal to reduce energy use, water use, and food waste. And we had three objectives to measure the energy and water use in production. Um, and measure uh, seafood waste throughout the, the U.S. supply chain and integrate the findings, develop recommendations, and communicate and so forth. Mark, can I ask the students to do something real quick? Sure. Yeah. So who here eats salmon? Okay. Okay. So who here, like, only eats wild caught? <laughs> okay, so if we get to the end, I want I want you, in your mind, yeah. I don't eat wild caught. <laughs> Um, yeah. We're going to more find expensive. out. We're, We're going to find out. So, out. in your mind, set a hypot which which source which is better which is better for the environment, the wild caught salmon or the farm raised salmon. And don't answer. I don't know the answer. Only you know. So think about it in your mind, and we'll see if we get there. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so, <clears throat> the approach was a life cycle inventory (LCI). You may have heard LCA, life cycle uh, assessment. This is just the inventory phase of that. We don't go into some of the other um, uh, uh, indices that life cycle assessments use. We collected both primary and secondary data. Uh, and I'll explain the difference between those in a minute. On the infrastructure, energy, water use, waste, byproducts, and uh, from the net quest slash farm to the plate. And then we constructed the life cycle inventories, and then we conducted a uh, sensitivity and uncertainty analysis. And then uh, as a, as a uh, parallel, we also developed a waste model, a model uh, that used previous methods by Dave Love, uh, primarily, uh, who was one of the uh, um, co-PIs on the project. Uh, so <clears throat> the research approach, you need energy characterization factors. And those are uh, how much energy is in a piece of paper. And that requires using a um, database life cycle on the SEMA Pro, excuse me, the SEMA, uh, the database is EcoInvent, and that the software that brings it all together is called SEMA Pro. And we use the RECIPI uh, midpoint method for the impacts assessment. Now, RECIPI uh, is an acronym for a bunch of French words, and I can't pronounce any of those, <laughs> so RECIPI. But it's, it's essentially an accounting uh, methodology, what we count and what we don't count when we're evaluating things. And there are, there are about six or eight different ones within the SEMA Pro software, and we're using that one. Uh, Life cycle assessment people understand that and they go, oh yeah, yeah, you're good. You're using because that's the most popular one. All right. Focused on fossil depletion. So this is the energy characterization factors. And so this is um, the um, impact assessment that we're doing from SEMA Pro. It's called fossil fuel depletion. It's essentially how much fossil fuel is used in the production of, of things. The characterization factor for fossil uh, fuel depletion is the amount of fossil fuel extracted based on the lower heat battle. All right. The unit will be kilograms of oil equivalent, and then we transform it into megajoules of energy, megajoules of energy, using 42 megajoules per kilogram. The water characterization factor is, again, using recipe, fresh water depletion potential, and the units are cubic meters that we convert to liters. <clears throat> we adhere to the, all right, and so for water, there are many definitions of water. There's no single water when you're dealing with life cycle inventories and life cycle assessments. So we adhere to the definition blue water as the water that has been sourced from surface or groundwater resources and has either evaporated or been incorporated into a product or taken from one body of water and returned to another. So if I take water and I'm growing fish, I take water out of the Mekong River, I run it through my fish ponds and I put it back into the Mekong River, that doesn't count because I'm just borrowing it. Now I'm adding stuff to it and there's concern about that. So we did not account for gray water and that's what is considered gray water. If you use it, put some stuff in it, and then put it back, 
it's no longer blue water in some definitions, it's gray water, but we had no way of knowing what the quality of those discharges were. Nobody keeps track of it. So we could not account for gray water. So we're only accounting for water that is lost, essentially. That's an important uh, thing. Okay, <clears throat> we analyzed the top 10 aquatic foods consumed in the US. That represents about 80% of total consumption. And here they are. So we use mostly shrimp. And of that, most of it is farmed. Only about 4% is wild caught. Now, if you're in Florida, that might change a little bit <laughs> as, they, as the, the country as a whole. The next uh, most used or uh, consumed is salmon. Farmed is the largest. Wild caught is about half of that. Canned salmon. I mean, anybody ever eaten canned salmon? Oh, I was growing up. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's all you had. Yeah. <laughs> there was no fresh or even frozen salmon. It's canned salmon, right? Uh, <clears throat> the Brits and the Canadians eat a lot of it. In fact, most of what we catch in the United States, i.e., what we catch in Alaska, is doesn't come to the United States. It goes to Britain um, and to uh, Canada. They eat a lot of canned salmon. We don't. We don't eat very much. Where are the canneries? Hmm? Where are the canneries? Uh, well, for this particular species, the sockeye, they're in um, um, Alaska on Bristol Bay. And we'll, uh, I may have some more to say about that one. Tuna is the next biggest fresh canned. Canned is the largest percentage of that. 92% um, is canned tuna, hardly any fresh or frozen. And then you go on down, tilapia, catfish, and pangasius. Catfish is the food, is the uh, um, Species that we grow in the, in, in the United States. In Vietnam, they grow a, a type of catfish called Pangasius. It is air breathing. Ours catfish aren't. So all of the ponds, well, we'll get to it in a minute, but all the ponds to grow catfish have to be oxygenate, oxygenated, whereas in Vietnam, they don't have to do that because the fish just come up and breathe air right at the surface um, of the uh, pond. Pollock, cod, crab, flatfish, scallops, it goes on down. These are very small percentages, <clears> obviously. <throat> and then the 20% that isn't represented by this is what we call various. And there's just all kinds of, of stuff associated with that. Uh, I don't remember why I did that. <laughs> <laughs> no, LCI results are given in megajoules and liters per kilogram of, uh, that should be megajoules per kilogram and liters per kilogram of product. Energy, megajoule is one to the six, one million joules, water is liters. To place the results, all these results in perspective, an average car gets 15 kilometers per megajoule of fuel. All right, just so you got something to relate it to, because megajoules don't mean much to most people. The average shower takes 65 liters of that. And the average per capita seafood consumption in the U.S. is about 22.5 kilograms per, per year. year. Yeah, yeah, per year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I erase this? Yeah, yeah. Well, let's put those numbers here so I'm going to remember it. I won't remember uh, So, uh, 15 kilometers per megajoule and 65 liters uh, per shower and 22.5 kilograms per capita year. All right. Just so we have it, so I can remember. All right, so the, I'm going to give you an example of all of the analyses we done, we have done, and we're going to use the catfish. And um, <clears throat> you know how cities have uh, painted cows, and, and some of them have uh, uh, painted dolphins as their thing, and you see them uh, scattered around the city. Well, this particular place we were at, they had painted catfish, <laughs> because catfish was a really big uh, thing. Where was that? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's either Arkansas or um, um, or Mississippi. I, um, I don't remember. I, I'm sorry, Alabama or Mississippi. That reminds me, I was there. 
I flew in, somebody picked me up at the airport and took me out into the field, all right? And I called my wife and I said, and she says, where are you? And I said, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm in one of those A states. <laughs> and I didn't know whether Arkansas, Alabama, <laughs> so it was Alabama. <laughs> all right, so this is a system diagram of catfish product and you have um, the water algae production, and there's the catfish, and here's a hatchery, and here's the feed production. So all of this stuff goes into feed, the feed goes into the hatchery, and into the catfish here. The hatchery, of course, um, feeds fit a catfish. Then you have a processing phase and a, and a packaging phase, and there goes the product. And there's a thing called offal, which is a, um, all of it you don't eat, all the guts and heads and tails and fins and whatnot. All right, farm catfish is the largest aquaculture sector in the U.S. Current production is about 150 million kilograms per year, uh, principally in Mississippi. Oh, see, there's three. It is Arkansas. I'm mean, great. <laughs> I wasn't too far off. It was one of those age states. Anyway, Mississippi, Alabama, and Arkansas. The total surface area in catfish is over 21,000 hectares. These are what the ponds kind of look like. Uh, there's a catfish, of course. And then this is one of the processing uh, um, facilities that we've got data from. Catfish are raised in earthen ponds, four to five acres in so hectares in size with a depth of about two meters. Uh, ponds have to do both waste treatment and oxygen production. And since um, uh, during the night, there is no oxygen production, almost all of these have to be aerated uh, at nighttime, uh, nighttime to keep the fish alive. Um, let me read the rest of it. Okay. Um, the um, feed uh, is soybean, cottonseed oil, uh, corn, wheat, a little bit of animal meal, fish or animal fat, vitamins and minerals. So the, there's a something very important to aquaculture, and that's the feed conversion ratio. And that's how many kilograms of feed to produce one kilogram of fish. So you can see it's about 2.4 to 1. It takes 2.4 kilograms of feed to produce one kilogram of fish. The catfish require aeration, and it winds up being somewhere around 3 kilowatt hours per hectare um, um, every night. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> so there's one of them. <laughs> Bizarre place. Production data were collected from nine commercial catfish fisheries. The total production was, uh, uh, their total production was about 12 million kilograms. The total pond area was about 2,000 hectares, representing about 10% of the U.S. cat food production. So we collected data from those producers. Um, and then the female data was collected from just two businesses, but they were huge, and they supplied most of the feed uh, to this area. Processing data was collected from three biz uh, businesses, and their annual production was about 20 um, 21 million kilograms uh, processed. So we feel like we had a representative sample of the, of the total industry. That's what we call primary data. So primary data is the data you collect yourself. Secondary data is the data you get from the literature. Okay. So inputs to produce one kilogram of cat feed. So this is just the data. So many um, um, Kilograms of soy, cotton seed, and so forth. You can see that uh, it produced one kilogram of uh, feed. Um, and then the inputs to produce one kilogram of catfish fingerlings. So this is the first stage. And of course, it takes catfish feed. <laughs> In this case, the, the uh, conversion uh, ratio, uh, uh, feed conversion efficiency is about 1.6. So these little guys are more efficient at grabbing the food. And there's buildings and steel and uh, silo tower and concrete and fiberglass that shows you the kind of data that we collect and the quantities of those. So these quantities get multiplied by the conversion and the energy conversion factor in order to put them into energy. How much energy does it take? Uh, this got slipped. So uh, a cubic meter of infrastructure. So, okay. Inputs to produce one kilogram of lightweight catfish. Um, these get smaller in number because the inputs there are, are, are less. You're only feeding them um, and the fingerlings, and then there's transport and a lot of diesel, petroleum, and electricity. Again, these are 
this is the raw data that we collected. And Tim produced, uh, this is the catfish product. So this is what has goes into the processing phase. You know, a little bit more stuff. We got breadcrumbs and batter and trisodium phosphate and cardboard boxes and so forth. All right. And the data for each of the preceding inventories are multiplied by an energy and water conversion factor, ECFs or WCFs, to obtain the EcoInvent data uh, obtained from the EcoInvent database. So here's just a couple of examples. So the unit here is a fish curing plant, and the quantity is 8.77 e to the minus five units of a of, of, of plant. To produce kilogram. one kilogram of catfish. The ECF for that is three e to the fourth. The WCF, the water um, conversion factor, is 2.31. So then you multiply that times that and you get that. So this is how many megajoules are consumed in providing the, the uh, fish curing plant, the plant itself. And this is based on the total lifetime of the plant and the total quantity of, uh, of fish that are processed through it. So for every kilogram of fish that's processed through it, um, 2.7 megajoules of energy were spent in, in making that plant. And then this is the amount of water. So it, all of those are the same thing. And uh, trisodium phosphate, it's there, but it's just, I forgot to, uh, it's really small. <laughs> it's not very much per kilogram in terms of energy. Okay. Is, is that like a preservative? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Are we cool? All right. So this is what it looks like if you do a sand key diagram. Here's the feed and the ingredients, and this is direct energy, and then indirect. And indirect is uh, what is embodied in things that are used, like a truck. How much energy is there embodied in that truck? Um, to produce one kilogram, again, one kilogram of catfish product. So the indirects are quite small. The direct is huge. And then the amount of energy in the feed is um, fairly large as well. So there's feed production, and that's the amount of energy in the feed ingredients. And then that's the direct energy that goes into that. And so then you've got those converging here. Um, and there, there's a little bit of energy that goes into fingerling production, not much. And then that's the catfish production. Uh, and then there's additional energy that goes into processing. And these were two different processors. Um, anyway, so it comes out uh, on average, the catfish product is about 94.6 megajoules. Yes. Um, so the fingerling production is just like when the catfish are small? Yeah, they produce up to this size. They're produced in, in one facility, mm -hmm. and, and then true. they are put into a tanker truck <laughs> and driven to the catfish pond. And then okay. um, it's I have movies of it, but I didn't put it in here, and they dump them into the catfish pond. So they go into the catfish pond. They're about that big. Mm -hmm. So for our convert 15 kilometers per megajoule, so about 100 megajoules. Yeah. So you could drive 1,500 kilometers. Am I doing it right? Yeah. No, no. Sorry. 15 kilometers per megajoule. Yeah. yeah. On on if you put it if you put a kilogram of salmon in your tank. <laughs> right. No. It, no. <laughs> but it's a but lot of energy. Energy, energy would allow you to do that, but, but this stuff doesn't. Right. So it's a lot There's of energy. Some energy here. Yeah. All right. So keep it in mind. <clears throat> You can drive 15 kilometers on a megajoule, so 1,500 kilometers for that one kilogram. Kilogram is 2.2 pounds. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of energy in food. All right, oh, you can you drive. There it is. <laughs> yeah. What can I say? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, here's the water one. <laughs> and it takes about, uh, in, in the US, catfish, it's huge. Um, because they are very poor water managers. <laughs> and a lot of them are pumping groundwater, putting it into ponds, and there's a huge evaporation off of those ponds. So there's a lot more uh, water that goes into U.S. catfish versus um, Vietnam catfish. And so that, you could take 25 showers for um, the amount of water that goes into that one kilogram of catfish. All right, so... This is another example now comparing farmed and wild caught salmon. Um, 
And again, this is only energy. So this is the farming technique that primarily is used in Norway. Um, big pens in the ground. <clears throat> they have a feeding um, gun that sits in the middle shooting out pellets of feed. And it just spins like this continuously. Mm -hmm. It never stops. Well, it, it will. And then they have cameras in the water below the fish, all right? And those well, cameras are aimed to count the number of pellets that go through the its vision um, area. Mm -hmm. And when there are a certain number of pellets, in other words, that's feed that is not being consumed by the fish, they slow down this thing. Or, or maybe they speed it up. Less feed. I don't know. Less feed. Uh -huh. So they're judging the amount of feed they put in there to feed these guys based on how much the fish don't eat using uh, just a, a, a video and, and some kind of an AI thing that counts the number of pellets that fall through. It's, fat, it's fat, fascinating. Very, fascinating. very, very um, <clears throat> industrialized. <clears throat> All right, wild caught salmon. This is in uh, Bristol Bay in Alaska. You've got uh, environmental production, which is all of the energy that goes to making the salmon from uh, river and and lake in the in the highlands, uplands to two years in the ocean, two years on land, two years in the ocean. All of that energy is what is there, free. You don't have to pay for that. You pay for all of that stuff. <laughs> so you got fishing, uh, boats, and tender, and all the transportation that goes in. Here's the processing and packaging. And then out comes canned, what we call head and gut, which is a, um, a, a fish that has been gutted, but it still has its head on. And that is um, fresh salmon that comes to the U.S. And when it gets to the U.S., they usually cut the head off. Um, it's crazy that they don't uh, cut it off before it goes to the U.S. because they're, but anyway. And then uh, there's um, some fillet and uh, some uh, to the U.S., Asia, Canada, and Europe. And then there's this thing called oval, which is the waste products. Farm salmon, <clears throat> it's got a lot more stuff going on. Uh, you have freshwater um, rearing. So they, they um, grow these fish out to they're about this big in freshwater tanks on land, and then they transfer them into the uh, fjords, into the salt water, which is this part. And then you have um, processing here, fuels and goods, electricity and services and labor all going into it. <clears throat> all right, uh, energy comparison of head and gut. Um, there's a couple of other forms, but we're just going to uh, focus on head and gut. This is sockeye salmon. That's the salmon from <clears throat> uh, Bristol Bay in Canada, uh, in Alaska. Pink salmon is also caught in, in that area, but it's a, it's a different species and they use different techniques to catch that. And then this is Atlantic salmon, the, uh, the salmon that is um, uh, grown in, in Norway as well as in Chile. And the companies in Chile are, are primarily owned by the Norway companies, so they are using basically the same technology as Norway is. So if you're buying it and it says it's a, a product of Chile, it's going to be the, the same as if you bought it and it said product of Norway. And this is the water consumption uh, for those uh, <clears throat> three uh, uh, fish. And then this is the fishing and grow out and processing and the packaging. So you can see where uh, the majority of the energy is. The uh, fishing is not very much, um, and here it's uh, grow out is fairly significant, but the processing is much less here, and the packaging is much less. So you wind up with the Atlantic salmon and the sockeye being about the same. And the Atlantic is farmed, That's the and farm. the sockeye is wild. Is wild caught. Now, <clears throat> a, a word about sockeye and wild caught. The sockeye fishery in Alaska is one of the most heavily um, um, uh, regulated. regulated of all fisheries on the planet. They have these counters that on um, big towers on, out on the edge of the estuary where the fish are coming in. And there's a guy in there estimating what the, the number of salmon are that are coming in. They're also backed up by airplanes that are flying and doing counts. And 
they say, okay, um, this river is open today and we're gonna open it from 8 a.m. to 11. And then we close it down. And it's based on how many fish they believe you can catch and still have sufficient numbers that get by to go up and spawn and make new um, salmon. They've done a, an excellent job. The fishery is increasing. It's one of the only fisheries on the planet that actually has more fish today than it did last year. Uh, so, but it's heavily, heavily um, regulated. And one of the things is the size of the boat that you're allowed to have. Well, you know, as you well know, if, if I'm limited by my length, but there's no limit to my width, and I want to be able to get as much fish as I can, I start building these boats that are absolutely ridiculous. They are floating shoeboxes. Yes. They're really wide and not very long, and it takes, and they have to get there fast. When they say, we've opened up this river and you've only got three hours to fish it, they gotta get there really fast. So they're incredibly overpowered to push the shoebox mm -hmm. through the water. And so you wind up with um, <clears throat> huge quantities of energy that, that goes into fishing. It doesn't show up there, um, well, like it should, but. We'll think about it for a minute. <laughs> anyway, um, it's a really inefficient uh, way of, of, of fishing. So this is what it looks like. Um, and then the water side, there's so much water in the farm to cut because of uh, just it's they're out in natu natural natural the, waters. There, there's right? the freshwater rearing portion, um, and they take water out of streams and discharge it directly into the ocean instead of putting it back into the stream. So they, it's a trans. It's yeah, a trans streams and, and lakes. Yeah. And they're, so it winds up being in use. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So those are examples of um, the detail analysis that we have done. And now we're going to look at the U.S. aquatic food system as a whole. And that's what it looks like when you start looking at um, stuff, where it's coming from and where it's going around the planet. Um, so this is the food chain. You have aquatic production, agricultural production, and you have environmental production, and that makes the feed. And this is what feeds the fishing industry. Then the aquaculture, then go, all of that goes into processing and packaging. And then you have transport, some of which is international transport, which winds up being a really important aspect of all of the energy consumption. And then, um, where there's not a lot of international, it's just domestic, that's what transport that's there. Wholesale and distribution takes energy, and then you have a retail market and food service. And then this is um, restaurants and um, cafeterias and stuff like that, food service. And this is then home preparation. It takes a lot of energy to prepare. And then consumption over here on the <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> primary data collected by the team. So wherever you see, uh, a primary, that's data we collected in the field. And unfortunately, we got cut short. So I didn't get to go to the, um, I didn't get to go to the South Pacific, although we, we had somebody there that collected some primary data for us. But I did do salmon, I did do shrimp, um, and the pollock and the cod were done uh, uh, while I was in Alaska as well. <clears throat> Secondary data, as I said, is uh, data from uh, um, from the literature. So this is a percent of U.S. aquatic foods in the diet. Again, shrimp is the biggest, salmon is the next, tuna is the next biggest, and then you go down from there. <clears throat> so we had to, if we're talking about a kilogram of seafood here. And so we had to weight everything that we were collecting, all that data had to be weighted by what percent of the diet. Because we want to know what's the average diet, how much energy is in the average seafood diet. We also did the individual species, which tells you what you should buy and what you should. <clears throat> so imported domestic, we roughly import 70% of all of the seafood that we consume. Um, the domestic is like 30, obviously. <laughs> but you can see what percent. Almost all of the shrimp that we eat is imported. Salmon is uh, almost all of it is imported. Tuna <clears throat> is about 50-50. When they say domestic, it's it's a domestic 
um, fishermen or fishing boat, um, uh, but it's it is still fishing in the <clears throat> South Pacific and um, in other places. <clears throat> Catfish is almost fifty percent imported and fifty percent domestic. It would be a hundred percent imported because um, the um, Vietnamese can produce catfish at about one quarter of the cost as, as we do it in the U.S. But the catfish lobbying uh, were able to get to federal government and put quotas on what can be imported. So they've kept it at about 50%. Yeah. So like for salmon, are you saying that most of it's imported? Is, Say it again? For salmon, how most of it's imported? Is the reason just for like economic stuff? Because weren't you saying that like we... Do farm salmon and all that? Uh, we don't farm salmon in the U.S. Okay. So they do in Canada. Okay. <clears throat> We're not cold enough. <laughs> we could possibly farm it in Alaska, but yeah. um, I think the fishing lobby has got a really strong hold there. And we could farm in um, Washington um, and maybe Oregon. It's cool enough there. But the species is the Atlantic salmon, and uh, there's been a really strong opposition to importing an exotic species into uh, the United States. So it's not going to happen. The same thing is true here with catfish. If we could import Angasius and then start growing that in place of the blue and the channel catfish that they grow in, in, uh, in, the, in the south, um, uh, the total quantity of energy and water that required would go way down. But they're exotic and uh, they, you know, they're not native, I should say. And so therefore they won't be ever ever brought into the United States. You can bring in dead Atlantic salmon, that's fine. You just can't yeah. bring in live Atlantic salmon. <clears throat> All right, and so this is wild caught versus farm. So most of the shrimp is uh, from outside and it's aquaculture. Most of the salmon is from outside and it's aquaculture. The fishery is quite small. Tuna, it's 100% fishery. They, we haven't figured out how to grow tuna yet. Um, and you can see the rest, tilapia. Um, catfish is, is almost 100%. <clears throat> and then the fisheries, pollock, cod, crab, all of those are 100% uh, live cod or fisheries. Are those totals, are they uh, weighted by mat, like by the proportion in the flow? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, weighted by each one of these. Yeah. So, that, so of the total, um, of, 47% is from fisheries and mm -hmm. roughly 53% is from, uh, from aquaculture of the total that we can see. <clears throat> energy requirements of cold storage equipment. So we had to get into figuring out how much energy goes into keeping um, a, a, a kilogram of fish frozen or cold. And so that's what all this is. The store uh, uh, energy use per uh, kilowatt hour of, of stuff, and then uh, the storage period, how, how long does it stay in, in walk-in refrigerators and in freezers and so forth, that's what that is. And then this is the mass energy, kilojoules per kilogram on the average for uh, seafood. This is a lot of six years worth of <laughs> data digging. Energy requirements for cooking, the same kind of thing. We had to figure out how much energy does it take to cook um, a kilogram of fish, depending upon whether it's in a fryer, a griddle, or a hot top, blah, blah, blah. And then this is residential as well. So the weighted average comes, and this is a weighted average based on how much fish uh, gets cooked that way, that way, or that way. <laughs> a lot of work. Anyway, <clears throat> it's been fun. It was amazingly fun. Sea transport, this is the big thing. We assume that all frozen seafood was transported by freight, by uh, ocean. There may be some cases where some frozen stuff is, is sent by airplane, but for the most part, the whole reason why you would freeze it is so that you can use a, a boat. Um, <clears throat> and then this is air transport, um, and that's all fresh. We assume any fresh fish that is imported had to come by uh, airplane. There's no way that you could put it on a boat and keep it fresh for as long. And so <clears throat> what we had to do is figure out what does it cost? I mean, it's coming from all kinds of places, from Africa, Asia, Australia, Europe, North America, which is um, Canada, and then South and Central. 
And so <clears throat> we had to simplify it a bit. And we said, okay, if it's coming from Africa, we knew well, from import data how many pounds of, or kilograms of all these different species were coming from these continents. That's all we knew. So we said, all right, if it's coming from Africa, we're going to assume it was shipped from Cape Town. You could argue with that and say, well, I know there is someplace else, but uh, if it was coming from Asia, we said it's shipped from Bangkok, which is kind of centroid to all of the Asian countries, so forth. You can see that. And then we said, okay, if it's coming from Africa by uh, Cape Town, the logical place for it to come is Savannah. <clears throat> and again, that's looking at import data and figuring out where most of the fresh fish come or where fish come and so so forth. So these are the estimate, that, and then the sea kilometers on the distance from Cape Town to Savannah, <clears throat> and distance from Bangkok to San Francisco. And then these are the megajoules per kilogram that you get when you do all of that, it multiplied by the energy per kilogram of stuff in, a, in an airplane. And so <clears throat> uh, six, uh, seven kilo, uh, megajoules per kilogram to, to 14 megajoules per kilogram, depending. The air transport, notice the difference. Here's the first, um, and, and, and then there we said, well, they don't just have to go to Savannah coming from Cape Town. So we, and they were spread out all over the country. So we took the centroid of the United, of the lower United States, which is Kansas City, believe it or not, or close. I mean, we had to have an international airport. So we said anything that is flying into the United States is going to Kansas City. It's a simplification, but if you think about it, if it's coming from uh, Cape Town, it could just as easy go to Houston, which is a little bit further, or, you know, and theoretically, it could go to San Francisco. So, <clears throat> again, a little uh, oversimplification, maybe, but notice that the, the quantities here are uh, significantly larger, and that's because it takes eight times the energy to fly a kilogram of fresh fish as it does to send it in a boat, eight times the energy. Okay, um, yield, losses, and waste. So, how are we doing? Woo. Yeah, we're not gonna make it. We got like seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> to decide what... Six years worth of yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. Is it fun yet? I mean, is, are you, That's are you really kind cool. of enjoying it? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is the yield uh, percent of the harvested fish, and you can see that you know it varies. Uh, up here, you've got roughly sixty percent. It's what you get um, from the fish. Forty percent is is um, um, uh, offal stuff that you don't use. Down here, in salmon is much higher. Shrimp, you know, uh, once you take the head off and the and the uh, body, the skin, uh, the, the shell, there's no, you know it's only sixty percent. Uh, fish, you get a little bit more, but as you come down, you get down here to crab, flatfish, and scallops, then uh, it drops off again, the amount of, of uh, food you actually get from the fish. And then this is the food loss and waste. So of, of that, 23% is wasted or lost. Um, about roughly, say, let's say 20% of salmon is wasted and lost after that loss. And then you can see on down. So, you know, somewhere on the order of about 20% is lost and wasted. And this was something new. Um, the paper that came out of this, uh, uh, Love et al. 2023. Up until this time, people were estimating 45% was lost and, and, and wasted. And with the detail analysis we did, we came up with less than half that. So pretty cool. Uh, Okay, results, U.S. aquatic food system. So, a lot of data. <clears throat> Megajoules. <clears throat> when it's red, it's bad. <laughs> it's, there's supposed to be green things in here <laughs> for good. <clears throat> the lowest here is um, uh, canned salmon. Oh, man. That's not what I wanted to hear. Um, and then also uh, canned tuna is pretty low as well. Um, so this is product processing, transport, and preparation. And then this is the total over here. So the bad stuff are wild-caught shrimp, 
uh, fresh salmon, and that's primarily the transport costs. So every time you go to a Whole Foods there and buy Atla fresh Atlantic salmon, which I really like a lot, um, you're you know, uh, using a lot, um, a lot yeah. more energy than if you will buy it frozen. <clears throat> the frozen, the freezing techniques they have now, people say, oh, well, frozen is not nearly as good. It's flash frozen. It goes in this machine. On the boat, usually. Yeah. Right? Or yeah. at the source. Yeah. yeah. It goes in a machine, and about two minutes later, it comes out the other side, totally frozen. It's amazing how fast it is. So you don't lose anything with, with frozen fish. Okay, food loss and waste. I'm going to um, um, blow away that. <clears throat> Principal losses. <clears throat> anyway, we did all that. So uh, quantifying resource use and food loss in the U.S. And I'm going to go past that. Um, so here's the, the bottom line. Aquaculture, the best you could do would be tilapia and then catfish <clears throat> and then salmon frozen. Not much difference there. Even shrimp, but the fresh stuff. And all of that, this green is transport. And that's the energy, energy right? on the left, energy on the left. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is energy and this is water over here. <clears throat> Catfish is bad for water use. So if your thing is water, then <laughs> frozen shrimp. If your thing is energy, then you want uh, frozen tilapia. Okay. Um, and then this is the capture fisheries. And the worst is, again, shrimp, flatfish. Flatfish are really expensive energetically because they're, they're, they're stuck on the bottom and they've got to drag these things through the water to try and kick them up. And the best is um, canned salmon, pollock. <clears throat> so pollock is that white fish. Whenever you go to a restaurant um, or especially a fast food restaurant and you order a fish sandwich or anything, that's pollock or Mrs. Paul's fish sticks are yeah. pollock. So if we say here that for like salmon frozen and salmon fresh, the aquaculture energy use is more than for the the wild caught salmon. Yeah, yeah. So that's not what I was expecting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is comparison with other protein sources. So here's the product, and these protein sources are just for production. They're not for all of the phases that we went through. So I'm only comparing production numbers here which is either fishing for or growing to the live weight fish or live weight seafood. So that's what these are and that's what that is. So the good guys are canned salmon, um, uh, fresh tuna, believe it or not, and can, but this is just the production, the, the production phase yeah. and pollock, of course. The bad guys are crab, flatfish, uh, scallops, and that's for energy and then water, the good guys are in play through here, you can see. So for comparison, this is the production energy and water use for chicken, pork, and beef, in other words, other, other protein sources. And the numbers are around 30, <clears throat> except for beef, which is higher. And I, I don't know why. It's just, I just, this is secondary data. I've taken it and used averages from the from the, from the, from the, from the literature. Uh, but you can see that, you know, the good guys are within the same realm. So the energy, energy per um, um, protein source, whether you eat beef, chicken, or pork, or you eat um, um, seafood, they're not obviously really, really different you know, within the same ballpark. The water use is a lot larger here, but I don't think they're using the, the blue water definition that we're using. Uh, they might be using any water that is put on a crop or anything else. So it comes up to be much higher. So which species has the lowest environmental burden overall? All right. Now, this is taking the, uh, the data uh, from the entire uh, source. How are we doing? This will be, this will have to be the, the big finish. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the best canned salmon. We don't eat it here. <laughs> Um, then you might say canned tuna. We eat a lot of that. Keep eating it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, this doesn't say anything about the health of the fishery itself. All right? The, the uh, tuna fishery is in bad shape. The only good uh, good shape uh, fishery that I know of is the sockeye salmon from, uh, from Alaska. 
all of this stuff down here is really bad scallops. I like scallops, but um, it's not good. All right, and then in terms of water, these are the best. <laughs> Doesn't take much water um, uh, for the canned crabs and so um, and so. All right. Uh, comparison of wild and, and farmed. Um, this is total energy to total water. Farmed is um, less energy, but more water, <coughs> as you might expect. Uh, that's for shrimp. Uh, the wild caught is lower, <coughs> but that's just this. This is an average of the um, sockeye and the pink salmon. And the pink salmon, they use a totally different fishing technique. Um, it's a um, kind of, uh, uh, I forget the name of the net, but it's, they don't pull the net through. <clears throat> they encircle and lift it up. And so the amount of energy required to do that for pink salmon is much lower. So that's why the wild caught comes up with the mess. Um, again, Pollock. Again, that's the same thing. The technique that they use for fishing for Pollock. Pollock is a schooling fish, and they're able to surround it with a big old, uh, I don't want to say the name of the net, but yeah, and pull yeah. it out of the water. Okay. So this is what it looks like. When you take all of those fish and you um, all of the energies that go in, and then you weight it by their percentage of the total, that's how much energy is required to put the average uh, U.S. citizen on uh, their seafood diet, which is 95.8. And that's equal to about 32,000 miles driven. So you could, with the energy that goes into the seafood, um, you could drive 32,000 miles, which is probably three times what most people drive in a year. It's a huge quantity of energy. Now that's not to say that seafood is bad. The numbers here are roughly the same as other protein sources. So that means that, you know, you know our food, we, and rightly so, we want to invest a lot of energy in food. <laughs> the water, 170 liters, and that's equal to about one shower per week. All right. 96 megajoules for energy production. I should stop. <laughs> <laughs> it's about 50% of the total. Um, yeah. So, uh, so let's give Dr. Brown a round of applause. That's an amazing pathway to the seafood uh, industry. And if you have to go to class, that's fine. But I'm, I have a bunch of burning questions. I'm sure some of you have some questions. So any questions, um, please go ahead and ask our speaker. I'll check if we have any on Zoom or YouTube. <laughs> All right. Well, I know we sometimes they just take a second and everyone's got their next class. But any questions for Dr. Brown? Yeah, Dustin. I see the result of the amount of work that are introduced for this. And then I would like to know the challenges you and your team face. The challenges that we faced. Yes. The big one was when COVID hit and we could not go directly to the places of production and processing uh, because there was no travel. And so then the, the challenge became trying to get the data from people at a distance by texting them or by um, calling uh, or by um, emailing them and asking them for the data. And it, it, it's very easy for them to say, yes, of course, I'll get to it. And then, you know, six weeks later, we would write them again and say, well, have you had a chance to do it? So um, I've been around long enough collecting data that I know full well that the, the best way to get data is to be sitting across the table from somebody and saying, give me the data. That was the biggest challenge. Um, <clears throat> in terms of... Um, it was all very straightforward. We had a very detailed questionnaire when we were sitting across the table. We would say, how much energy does it take to do this? And how much, uh, what's the size of your plant? And, you know, how much, <clears throat> anyway. So that was probably the, the biggest um, issue. Yeah. Yeah. Ashley, I see you have a question there. You can unmute. Yeah. Um, so my question was out of, uh, when you were looking at comparing 
seafood to other protein sources? You focused on animal protein sources. Have you ever considered looking through the literature to see if anyone's done anything on, for example, plant protein like soy? Um, I have not. And um, that's the next project. I want What I'm trying to do is to do this level of detailed analysis for all the foods that are consumed by, by humans, especially in the United States, since that's where we started. Um, I had done, uh, many years ago, I had done a comparison of beef to the concentrated protein powders, and beef won under that circumstance, that by the concentrating uh, protein from uh, other sources down to a can of powder uh, takes more energy than it does to, to grow beef, especially if it's not um, feedlot uh, beef, uh, but it's you know grass-grown beef. Then that that is less energy than uh, protein. But I haven't done soy uh, directly. Great, thanks, Alex. I see you have your hand up. Please, you can unmute. Yeah, uh, my question is about. I'll just ask specifically for the canned sand, the canned tuna, because I was a, on the lower level for energy. How much uncertainty was there? in those averages for that one particular, just to pick one? Uh, not much. Uh, we had we had very good data from um, um, producers, which are the fisher uh, people, uh, boats, and from the um, canneries, uh, the, the processors. Um, so I think, our uncertainty was on a scale of one to 10, very certain is 10, was in the area 8.5 to nine because of the fact that it was all um, data that we collected directly uh, from, uh, from the producers. You understand that when you do secondary data, the uh, uh, uncertainty goes way up because you're relying on somebody else's uh, idea of, uh, of what is, for instance, what's what's water use. Um, and we don't know how, and that secondary data, how they actually collected data. So our primary data always was about 8.5 to 9, 9.5, depending upon the, the sources. All right, thanks. So we got to let everyone go, but one more round of applause for Dr. Brown. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you all next week. We have Dr. Natalie Nelson from uh, North Carolina State Dr. University. Clark, if you're listening, where are our onions? Dr. Clark, Mark Brown wants to know where the onions are. We'll see everyone next week. Thanks, YouTube. Uh, we. Uh,